Uh, our next speaker is actually on Zoom, um, and he should be there. He is uh, Albert Jing from uh, Vadim's lab, and he actually got a travel award to come here. He showed up in the airport, and then they rejected his visa. So uh, that's a tough one. Um, so, so he's on Zoom. Okay. Hi, Albert, can you hear me? Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. We can see your slides. Thank you so much for giving your talk, and uh, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, as, as more than just introduced, it's unfortunate that I, I cannot be there in person, but I'm still very excited to share with you um, our work on uh, causality informed um, aging biomarker and the clock base online. So, just to introduce, I'm Albert Ng. I'm a uh, fifth year PhD student in Vadim Gladyship lab at Harvard Medical School. And uh, I started. So um, so the DNA methylation really changed during the during aging. And we, as previous speaker already introduced, we know that when we combine this information with machine learning technique, we can predict a highly accurate algorithm that is able to predict the age of the sample. We call it's so accurate we call it uh, epigenetic clock. Uh, epigenetic clock is great, but there are some problems here. So to show you the problem, I will I will just um, um, invite you, all of you here to build a clock in real time with me right now. So so what uh, what clock uh, is doing is that it's take the feature from the population population and then they use this feature to predict the age. So here from this figure of young people and old people, we can already take some features. So for example, we know that uh, old people are like slow, have a slow gait speed, have a, a, a worse vision. Uh, they use scan, they use glasses. So basically using this algorithm here, we can uh, already successfully predict the age of the uh, young people. They would predict to be 20, which is great. And old people, they predict to be 60, which is also great. And so far, so good. So there's no problem here, but the problems start to manifest when we're testing uh, intervention. So, for example, now we invite the young people to wear some glasses and use some can. So suddenly, based on our model, their age is predicted to be 40 years old. So should we call it age acceleration? And similarly, we can invite old people or force them to remove their glasses and the can. And suddenly, based on our model, they are predicted to be 40 years old also. And this is 20 years younger than their chronological age. So should we call it uh, rejuvenation? So of course not. So it's very clear here this uh, because we use a very straightforward example. So in our clock, the slow gait speed and bad vision are are damaged. So this this kind of feature we want to reverse or remove by our anti-aging intervention. But the can and glasses usage are we call it adaptation or adaptive. They they act against the damage and they are protecting our um um. Uh, body, so they're not necessarily uh, to be removed, at least not pr primarily. So uh, this it's very clear in this clock, but if we look at epigenetic clock, it will be much more complicated because we are dealing with this uh, CBG methylation site across the genome. We have no idea what they are doing, so it's, it's um, hard to separate them, like which one is damage, which one is adaptation. So this is what we're doing here. So to know, to understand which methylation site are belongs to damage or, or adaptation, first we need to know what's their causal uh, effect on the lifespan or aging relative phenotype. So uh, so how do we assess the causality? So the, the traditional or growth standard way is, uh, is do a trial. So in human, we do randomized clinical trial. So we uh, randomize our uh, patient into intervention and control arm and we can give them some intervention to manipulate their methylation uh, state of certain CBG site. And then we measure the outcome, for example, lifespan or health span, and the difference between these two arms is our causal effect. But of course, it's not very realistic to do it here because we have millions of the CBG site across the genome. It's, it's impossible to do this a million clinical trial. So instead, we use a smart approach called Mendelian randomization. It's, it's used a very similar principle. So instead of uh, uh, manually uh, introduce the intervention, we use a genetic variant that uh, appear near the CBG site that has the effect on the methylation level. We use it as an instrument. And 
and we by comparing comparing people carrying different kind of uh, genetic variant promoting or like uh, deregulating the genes uh, the the DNA methylation level at certain site we can also assess their uh, a costly effect of the DNA methylation on the, our outcome of interest. So here we did this uh, epigenome-wide Mendel randomization. We assessed the uh, potential causal effect of the uh, 24, uh, 420,000 420, DNA methylation site across the genome, and we checked the uh, uh, 12 different aging-related outcomes. So you can see their lifespan, health span, uh, healthy aging, a like lot of different kind of phenotype. We we we, uh, we, collab, uh, we collected from different sources. But here, I want to focus on this aging GIP one because it's a um, uh, it's a, a genetic principle uh, component analysis. It's kind of combining. You can consider it's combining information from health span, lifespan, and it can be considered as a genetic representation of the healthy aging. So this is what our result look like. So each dot here is the DNA methylation site. And you can see uh, our top hit is actually uh, the CG12 something uh, in the Huntington locus. And the previous EWA study shows that they, uh, it's related to head bone mineral density. And our result shows that this methylation site has strongest positive causal effect on lifespan. So basically, if you have higher methylation on this side, you're more likely to cause you to uh, live longer and so on. And similarly, you can see there are really different kind of methylation site and different kind of the mechanisms. So, um, and we we did some enrichment analysis to see whether our uh, the CPG site will identify our enriched in certain region, and we show that uh, they are kind of enriched in this uh, functional region. For example, the enhancer and promoter, but they are depleted in this uh, non-expressed uh, quiescent region. And we also we also show that the uh, causal CPG site will identify our tend to be more conserved uh, during the evolution. So now, as we promised, as we have this causal effect estimated, now we can assess the um, which, which uh, methylation change are damaged and which of them are uh, protective. So, um, so imagine we put our, uh, uh, the effect of the estimated causal effect of the uh, DNA methylation side on X axis and age related change on Y axis. And now they, uh, they will separate all the methylation side in methylation change in this four quadrant. And uh, I will show you the real data to explain. So for example, here, uh, for example, these CPGs are here, they have positive, uh, we, we predicted it have positive effect on longevity. And this mes the methylation level of this site also increased with age. So in this case, we call it protective. Uh, it's a protective increase because you have a, it's good to have more methylation level and it's a methylation level actually increased during age and so on and so on. And in reality, we really find a lot of uh, different CPG sites across the genome uh, that's located in this four quadrant. And uh, and we we do this, um, we sum all this effect up and we found that the cumulative effect are tend to be more damaged, which, which is aligned with our um, usual perception. And with this information, we can now really build this um, Epigene uh, uh, cause causality informed uh, biomarker of aging. So basically, we uh, I will I will I will not go through the detail of the model, but basically we take the information from the Mendelian randomization, the causal information, and we merge this information to build a clock. So we build three different type of clock. One is a uh, cost age, which is uh, built on all causal CPG site and damage using only CPG site uh, um, we detected as damage and uh, adapt age using only the uh, adaptation related CPG site. So just look at their predictive power, they look very similar. So in the general population, all these three clocks work, work very fine in predicting the chronological age of the individuals. And we also found that when we increase, so this causality factor uh, control how many information from the, how many causal knowledge we input to the model. So we show that the more knowledge we uh, import to the model, the, actually the performance of the model on the general population is worse. So this makes sense because the model, uh, the accuracy of the model is de depend on the uh, correlation. And the, here we use this causal information, which is kind of disrupting the, uh, a little bit. But surprisingly, when we look at the mortality association, we found that uh, the, the, the damage, as, as we expected, people with higher damage, they tend to be have higher mortality risk. And 
And the cost age is in middle, it's still still significant. So you have higher cost age, you also have higher risk of mortality. But what's, what is really surprising is the adaptive age. So we found that uh, people who are shown to be older based on their adaptive age, uh, they actually tend to be live longer. They have uh, lower um, mortality risk. And and uh, ac across these three clocks, the damage really performed the best. So it's, you can see it's outperformed the Hannon and Horvath's age. And this, uh, comparable with the phenol age. And then we tested our clock in different kinds of interventions. So first one we tested is a reprogramming. So it shows that uh, as other clock, the damage and cost age really decrease, uh, the, uh, the predictive uh, age is decreased during the cellular reprogramming, but the adaptive age again shows the different trend they're increasing during program. And this is the uh, progerial syndrome. So we shows that, uh, so, our clock and um, the, the damage is able to show that the people with this progeroid syndrome, they, tend, they are um, epigenetically older uh, compared to the healthy control. And this effect is hard, um, very hard to be detected by first generation clock, but usually can be detected by second generation clock like uh, phenol age and green age. And again, this is another interesting case. We look at this, um, uh, uh, um, UV exposed uh, skin, so so uh, from left to right, uh, some protective skin dermis, some exposed dermis, some protective epidermis, and some exposed uh, epidermis. So our clock is actually only, only clock the damage is only clock that able to show that the some exposed epidermis is epigenetic older than the uh, some protected uh, epidermis. All other clocks they either doesn't show effect or show the opposite chain. So to summary, we built this first uh, causal DNA methylation. Uh, we identify the uh, causal DNA methylation site across genome for healthy longevity. We built this first causal biomarker of aging that potentially can separate damage and adaptation. And the damage is more responsive to uh, effect of the aging-related damage and short-term intervention. And so let's move to another topic. So um, so with so why we build all this clock? So to me, we build the clock to test intervention, right? So uh, so here we, we collected all the information from GEO. So there are over 200,000 samples in both human and mouse. We collected their uh, methylation and gene expression data, and we do this some standardization. And then we apply all existing, almost all existing clock models to them. So for each sample, we have a, um, a series of the uh, 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 methylation or transcriptomic age prediction. And it's, uh, it's actually online. Actually, we put it online maybe almost a year ago. And, um, it's, um, you can, you can click, you can search for the term or the geo number if you're interested in. You can actually do the st statistical analysis online to see, uh, whether your intervention can, um, can change the, uh, clocks. So this is what our database look like. So basically, each dot here is the sample, and the color is the uh, 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 here. Is the case, here is the Horvath age. So you can see that this is the UMAC embedding. So like a single cell, but here each each dot is the sample. So you can see we have a really diverse range of different kinds of samples. So it's, you can see a sperm. Uh, you can see this uh, um, this is some cancer tissue, some iPSC, and the color is uh, is uh, the age of the predicted age from Horvath age. And you can also even look at this um, uh, epigenetic age acceleration. So here, again, each dot is a sample, and the color represents the age acceleration term. So the red sample are uh, epigenetic older, and blue sample are epigenetic younger. OK, so what's next? So the next step for us is to, um, so now we have this 300K sample with different, uh, different ex experimental condition. But uh, everyone who uses GEO, they, they know that uh, uh, the Metadata from GEO is actually not very structured. So they are not in standardized format. So it's impossible for us to do this, um, the, the analysis for all this sample. So what I, what we do instead is we, uh, we, we put this feature to the, uh, GPT-4 and we prompt it to, uh, clean up this data, metadata for us. And then we use this, um, Full feature also I can infer some information from the unstructured test. So with this full feature metadata inferred by GPT-4, we can combine with the uh, age prediction uh, from the clock base. We can now do this uh, unbiased in silico screening for anti-aging condition or aging accelerating condition, which uh, uh, um, ever been done in uh, uh, 
any like experimental uh, any lab or group. And for this part, I need to thank Alex uh, from and his team in, in Silico and Hannah who annotate these uh, sample some of the sample manually and then not annotating. So sorry, not acknowledgement. So I need to thank uh, uh, people in Gladyshift Lab and uh, of the ARDD and my our uh, fantastic collaborator and uh, my PhD program. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Albert. That was a really great talk. Um...